Let's begin by reading responsibly from 2 Timothy 3. Words we're familiar with. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from a childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So pause for a moment. You know, one of the things that we... It's a very familiar verse. But essentially what it is telling us is something that is literally profound beyond our comprehension. We hold a Bible in our hands and we often say, well, that's a book written by men. But this text is telling us that Scripture is the very breathed out word of God. We're familiar with uh, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every, Every word that does what? Proceeds out of the mouth of God. When we pick up the Bible, here in church, Sunday school, when you pick it up at home, do we have that solemn conviction that what we have in our hands is the outbreath of God? The very words of God, uh, the writer of Hebrews, for the word of God is what? Living and powerful, sharp in the knee, two-edged uh, swords, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of man. Honestly, when you sit down, do we, are we under that load? Do we really, in practical terms, realize that we're not dealing with just the ideas of man long dead, but are we are dealing with the very word of God. Do we take it that seriously? I mean, honestly, that is really of the utmost importance. And I want to begin this morning with this, and you'll see why I bring this up later on. But just realize, and I want you to, we need to, we need to have this not just simply, obviously, every one of us would verbalize that, Right? But there's a difference between verbalizing it and coming to terms with it. And so I want to begin with that reality <laughs> that as we look in the Word of God, um, we are hearing the very words of God Himself with all the power and authority that belongs to Him. Let's pray. Dear Father in Heaven, we are so thankful for the day You've given us. We're thankful, Lord, for Your Word that has been made clear that You have kept it for us you have preserved it for us you have set forth in the most wonderful of ways your everlasting word heaven and earth will could pass away but your word will never pass away so i pray the spirit of god would just speak to us lay upon our hearts the power and the significance of the truth bless our singing lord bless our testimonies in a way that all things would bring honor and glory to you. In Christ's name, amen. If you would please stand for the reading of God's holy and precious word from Ezekiel chapter 12, the first 16 verses. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see, but see not, who have ears to hear, but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. As for you, son of man, prepare for yourself an exile's baggage and go into exile by day in their sight. You should go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand, though they are a rebellious house. You shall bring out your baggage by day in their sight as baggage for exile. And you shall go out yourself at evening in their sight, as those do who must go into exile. In their sight, dig through the wall and bring your baggage out through it. In their sight, you shall lift the baggage upon your shoulder and carry it out at dusk. You shall cover your face that you may not see the land, for I've made you a sign for the house of Israel. And I did as I was commanded. 
I brought up my baggage by day as baggage for exile. And in the evening I dug through the wall with my own hands. I brought up my baggage at dusk, carrying it on my shoulder in their sight. In the morning the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, has not the house of Israel, the rebellious house, said to you, What are you doing? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, The oracle concerning the prince in Jerusalem <coughs> and all the house of Israel who are in it, say, I am assigned for you. As I have done, so shall it be done to them. They shall go into exile, into captivity. And the prince who is among them shall lift his baggage upon his shoulder at dusk and shall go out. They shall dig through the wall to bring him out through it. He shall cover his face that he may not see the land with his eyes. And I will spread my net over him and he shall be taken in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it and he shall die there. And I will scatter toward, the, toward every wind all who are around him, his helpers and all his troops. And I will unsheath the sword after them. And they shall know that I am the Lord when I disperse them among the nations and scatter them among the countries. But I will let a few of them escape from the sword, from famine and pestilence, that they may declare all their abominations among the nations where they go and <clears throat> may know that I am the Lord. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated and let's again look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we come again. And I pray the Spirit of God would lay upon each and every one of us the seriousness and the significance of your word and to take to heart every single thing that proceeds out of your mouth. It is very easy for us, Lord, to say this isn't our flavor of ice cream. This isn't what we like. But God, you have given us everything. And so grant to us ears to hear hearts to embrace and Lord please help me that I might speak only your word and not my thoughts bless and guide Lord in Christ's name amen we come back to the book of Ezekiel and it is easy to come to such a book and wonder probably not so much out loud but to ourselves what in the world is the purpose of this book for us um you read through it, it's about a, it, it is written to a nation over 2,000 years ago. The problems they faced and the troubles that befell them seem to have nothing whatsoever to do with what's going on in our lives and in our day and age. As we work through the book, it's downright strange at times. It's provocative <clears throat> at other times, and at times it seems totally outdated. So the question, whether you're going to ask it or not, is this. So why in the world we're going to spend months looking through the book? That's a legitimate question, but the Bible has a legitimate answer. As I began this morning, we looked at the text in uh, 2 Timothy. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now, what Paul is doing in that paragraph is he's talking, uh, writing to Timothy. And Timothy is raised in a family where the word of God, mother and grandmother, per, uh, permeated the environment. It permeated the culture. They, they taught their child and their grandchild the scriptures. And clearly, without doubt, in the context when it talks about scripture, the first meaning or the first reference is to the Old Testament. Now, here's God telling us. He doesn't say some scripture, most scripture, or occasional scriptures. But what? All scripture. All scripture, and he defines scripture. It's written, that's what the word scripture means, that which is written. But this, what is written, is actually the breath of God. That is, it, these are his words given to us. And he makes the point. What's the value? He says, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. These are grouped. The first and the second is the fact that we need God to speak into us truth. Honestly, 
I say this with the kindest of words, every one of us is stupid spiritually, naturally. We really are. We're clueless. Left to ourselves, left to our own imaginations, we'll come up with some of the greatest folly imaginable. And in fact, we see that in our day and age. More and more people who are supposed to be preachers and supposed to be spokesmen in this world for the cause of Christ are actually simply <clears throat> coming up with ideas in their brain and just filling it out. But the word of God, this, all scriptures, the Old Testament, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 12, is to teach us and to train us. But in the middle, there are two statements. It is for reproof and for correction. That means there's something wrong with us. Now, you, if you're going to be honest with yourself, you come to Scripture, if you don't come to Scripture with the recognition that you need to be reproved and corrected all the time, you're in trouble. I don't think we really come to Scripture because he, he says all Scripture is profitable. He doesn't say this or maybe that or maybe this. Or, he says Scripture is profitable. Scripture is God-breathed for this purpose to train and teach us and to reprove and correct us. So when we come to this passage, Ezekiel, what does God want to teach you? And what does God want to reprove or correct you over? Now, I honestly cannot escape that's the intent of this scripture. If he says all scripture is for this purpose and he delineates the purpose, how in the world would I dare circumvent or veto God's word if I take it seriously? So here we are coming back to the book of Ezekiel. We've had been out for a while <laughs> and we're back to here. And, and I wanted to begin with that statement. You know, here is, here is um, the Word of God. We're coming, uh, we're, we're approaching the Word of God. We're in this strange book of Ezekiel. And the question is, how are we going to interact with it? What do I need to know from God? What do I need to be corrected by God? The last song we'll sing, their closing song is, Speak, O Lord. And in a sense, I was trying to think, He's already spoken. So we take that and say, speak, O Lord, really help me to hear what you have spoken. So essentially we come to this. If we're going to come as men and women of faith, we're going to say, speak, Lord. That is, grant me the capacity to hear what you have spoken. Now, <coughs> bringing us up to context, for centuries Israel has resisted the Lord and his word. God has sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet there have been some good kings and all of them trying to communicate God and his word. But time after time after time, they refused. They are stubborn, hard-hearted, resistant to anything and everything that God says. And so God has brought judgment upon them. Uh, the northern ten tribes were taken into captivity in, by Assyria and the southern tribes are being invaded or have been invaded by Babylon. Ezekiel is kind of in the very close to the end <coughs> of the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his troops had come in as God's judgment. They had already attacked the land. They had attacked Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, two times previous. Ezekiel is actually in, is in Babylon with other captives that took place in the second captivity and God's saying the third one is coming and it will be the end of the city of Jerusalem so God raised up Ezekiel to speak to the people in exile concerning their sin and also to speak also to the people of Israel in Judah and in Jerusalem and the words are so often hard and so often difficult Ezekiel is writing to the children of Israel from exile and trying to communicate to them the sternest of warnings possible. Now what you find, and we're, I'm not going to cover three chapters, but essentially what, what it's kind of like 
almost like a lawyer. God is coming and he's presenting his case. Chapter 12 is, this is against the people at large. Uh, he's going to call them a name in a minute, we'll see. But this is, this is the, the people in general. Chapter 12, he's against the, the prophets. <clears throat> the prophets were supposed to be the workmen or the spokesmen for God. Uh, one of the things you see about, the, about the, the, the major prophets, especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they set their target specifically on the people who were supposed to be the spokesmen for God. Okay, and it's very strong language. And, he is, and God uh, leaves nothing left to the imagination of his indignation and judgment for those who misrepresent him. And oh, are there so much misrepresentation of God today as there was in those days. And chapter 13 is about that. Chapter 14 is about, and he begins by talking about the elders, <laughs> those whom God had intended to be the caretakers, in a sense, the shepherders, of the people and God's against them as well and essentially what he's saying he's laying out the case this is why judgment's coming whether it's the people the prophets the elders whoever it is they have all refused and rejected me and so we're going to just look at this morning in chapter 12 regarding the people and their place in this big mess The people are a rebellious house. It's interesting. A central and often repeated description of this people is they are called a rebellious house. One of the things you find in uh, Ezekiel is that when the prophet wants to communicate something, he repeats it. The central phrase in the book of Ezekiel, the, the, the key phrase that occurs 68 times is that God does what he does, whether it's to judge or to save, that the people may know that he is, in the English, the Lord, but that, he may, that, that people might know that he is the I Am. That's what God, he says that repeatedly, 68 times. You see it several times in this chapter as well. <coughs> but here, he's repeating himself, and he, and he kind of like a, not, I wouldn't say a favorite, but a common term he uses for the people is that they are a rebellious house. As I said, 14 times in the entire book, six times alone in this chapter, he labels them as a rebellious house. Now, this was a description of the people at large with all a few exceptions. This is not a statement. He's not saying, well, some of you are like this. He is giving the general tenor, the general flavor, the general disposition the general attitude the general affections of the people at large and now mind you these are the people who have been taken out of their land have been exiled to babylon in god's judgment okay and you would think they would got it <laughs> wouldn't you but here under the inspiration of the spirit of god he calls them a rebellious house <clears throat> rebellion means showing a desire to resist the authority and control of God. Now, that was not, that's not only true of Israel, but it is true of all mankind. From the fall on, man has determined to be in charge of their own life. Um, there's a small book. It's, well, there's a big book and a small book, which is really informative of how we are in the mess we are in today. It's a book called The Strange New World by Carl Truman. And in it, it explains essentially everything that we see today is based on man seeking to be authentic to himself. It's called The Strange New World by Carl Truman. Man is seeking to be authentic to himself. And essentially, man is defined as <clears throat> you can be anything you want, do anything you want, and only then are you free. And what it is, it's in, in the simplest terms, it is the, so, it, is the, it is the search and the desire for autonomy. I will not have God tell me what to do. And that's the state of man. Always been. But here's Israel especially. God says, this is who you are. 
you are a rebellious people. You show a desire, a, a thirst, a hunger, a longing, in fact, to throw off my authority, to throw off my, care, my control, to throw off my laws so that you can rule your own life. And so they are a rebellious house. But what's interesting is he gets, <coughs> excuse me, he gets specific. Let me read again verses one and two. It says, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. And then he gives us an explanatory statement. You have eyes to see, but see not. We have ears to hear, but hear not. For they are a rebellious house. So he has the word rebellious house, a rebellious house. And in the middle is a phrase that is, <coughs> I think, helpful for us to understand what in this specific context he's, he's referring to. The key phrase is they have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. There was an outward and superficial acceptance of the Lord in his word in Israel's history. There was outward religiosity. You look in Isaiah and you look at some of the latter prophets and one of the things that seems strange is God will condemn the sacrifices. God will condemn their rituals. God will condemn their, <coughs> their new moons and their feast days and, and you scratch your head. Well, God, didn't you... Tell them to do it? <laughs> Why then are you critiquing them? Why are you criticizing them for doing the very thing you commanded them to do? And the point that what, what God is after through the prophets is, oh yes, they're doing the externals. They're accepting, in a sense, what is outward and what is external. In fact, Jesus will, will reference many of the prophets and he said, <clears throat> with their lips they honor me but with their hearts far from me and what ezekiel is saying is your rebellion consists in manifest in this you will give lip service yes oh the word of god is real you will give lip service <coughs> he says to these people and acknowledge that yahweh is your god but it is insignificant and entirely superficial Entirely superficial. And, and it was the flavor of the people. Now again, this is the scary thing. Ezekiel is addressing not a horde of pagans. He's not addressing a whole bunch of people <clears throat> who, are Ill, uh, who are illiterate of, of, of Old Testament history and of Old Testament scriptures. They were raised and taught to know these things the very culture they lived in, the very ways their months were, were delineated, everything in their culture and society spoke of God. Not like ours, theirs was. Theirs was, was truly to be a theocracy. There wasn't any aspect of their life, from the clothes they wore to the food they ate to how they play, plowed their fields, everything was to be saturated with God. And they would acknowledge that verbally. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yet, it meant nothing. And you see this as, as, it, as he goes on because they're in this having eyes to see, having eyes but did not see and ears to hear but they did not hear. <coughs> God says in this chapter that he is going to, if you will, remedy the problem. He is going to bring every single person to come to the recognition and know that he is Yahweh. He is Yahweh. Now, you know what that means? It means that the children of Israel, they were ignorant of who God. They were ignorant not of who God is as much as they were ignorant of God himself. <clears throat> when we think of knowledge, we think principally of information, don't we? Okay, I teach school. <clears throat> I try to get information to the kid's head. I test them, I quiz them, we talk in class, I review. And the idea <coughs> is to get across information. And a lot of times we think that principally is what it means to know God. To know God accurately. And indeed, that is significantly part of it. But knowing, it's not knowing about God. 
Remember what Jesus said, this is eternal life, that we might know him and the one whom he sent. What God is saying in the 68 times, he says, I'm doing this, you might know, is that man is utterly, naturally void, devoid of knowing God. They know about God, <clears throat> they're aware of him, but there is no and I think the idea is this, there is no attraction to God, naturally. In, in Romans, <clears throat> all they knew, although they knew God, they glorified or honored Him not as God, but neither, and neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and essentially turned their, their back on God and made for themselves idols. <clears throat> there is, therein lies the ultimate rebellion. Jettisoning everything about God. <clears throat> so the prophet comes and, and refers to these people as absolutely rebellious, superficial, and empty. What a, a, a frightening indictment that laid upon these people. These were the people of God. These were the people that God had rescued from Egypt with a mighty hand, didn't he? These are the people that God broke the back of Egypt. Uh, and enriched them with the plunder from Egypt, gave them a land that they did not have to work for, gave them his law, gave them his prophets, gave, 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 manifested himself time and time again. And yet every single time in the history of Israel, what were they doing? Rebellion. rebellion. That was it. You were a house of rebellion. And so here is the prophet <clears throat> by the power of the Spirit of God speaking the words of God. He says, you're a rebellious house. Oh, how scary it is. This, this was addressed not to the pagans, not to the Babylonians. He's not speaking to the Babylonians. <coughs> the, the prophets that addressed the northern tribes, they weren't speaking principally to the Syrians. But this was spoken to people who wore the badge, people of God. And that should begin to unsettle us. They wore the badge. They believed they belonged. <clears throat> the second part is the prophet, and he is an object lesson. He was to serve as a sign and a wonder to the people. One of the things we've already seen and we will see is that <clears throat> God had street theater for Ezekiel to perform. He acted things out in public. He did this with the hope and intention, as you see in verse 3, in order that perhaps the people might understand. It says in verse 3, As for you, son of man, prepare for yourself an exile's baggage and go into exile by day in their sight. You shall go like an exile from your place to another place in their sight. Perhaps they will understand though they are a rebellious house. If you will, in human terms, God threw it all at them. He will have strong, strong parables coming up. He's already performed, remember when he engraved the brick? Here he is carrying out what is going to take place. And he did this for years. In public, and in their face, he was proclaiming and teaching and trying to, if you will, get their attention so that perhaps they might come to their senses. But they would never on their own. That's one of the big lessons through the book of Ezekiel. On their own, they would never come to it. That's why, and it, it's actually, this is setting up the new covenant, the new heart. Because apart from a heart that God gives to us, we will never have a sense of who God is. And so what Ezekiel is doing, he says, this is God. He's throwing everything <coughs> he has at man, and man in their natural state will brush it off. You're ever brushing it off. No, it's no big deal. So, so what he does is he acts out 
he was to act out the results of the fall of the city of Jerusalem and the subsequent uh, captivity. The first thing he does is God says, you take a, a bag. It's kind of like, you know, this is, this is an, not an overnight bag. This is all you can carry. And the idea in the picture was that the city of Jerusalem was going to be ransacked by the Babylonians and you're going to try and sneak out. You're going to dig a hole in the wall and try to escape. Because there is no hope. The city has fallen. And what is interesting, you read in 2 Kings, I think it's 25, you see that very thing took place. In fact, <clears throat> the, Ezekiel addresses the king at that time, Zedekiah, not as king, but as prince. And what had happened? The, the, the city so constantly, even in, in, in judgment, forewarning judgment, they rebelled against God. And so what ultimately happened, here's the king, Zedekiah. He's captured as he's trying to escape. He's brought to, uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, who is some, you know, he's away from the city. And they slaughter his sons in his, in his sight and then blind him so that that's the last thing he saw. And it says, if you read it, it says, he will be taken to the land and he will not see. He's blinded. What a horrible thing. And what, what is taking place is this is a sense, a prophetic acting out of what's going to take place. Perhaps they'll listen. Now, this makes um, Jonah's interaction with Nineveh shocking and surprising, doesn't it? He comes to a wicked and vile city and preaches a six-word message. The six words in Hebrew. And what does the city do? They repent. Now, Jonah's upset, but they repent. And here, God coming after the children of Israel, century after century, decade after decade, millennium after millennium, and essentially what? No. Not only does he give an, an, an external manifestation of the escape, but also he's trying to communicate the idea of distress and anxiety. I mean, can you kind of remember the feeling you had in 9-11 when we were attacked? What did it feel like? Did, wasn't it scary? Okay, now none of us lived through Pearl Harbor. It's coming up, the celebration of it is. But what do you think, if, what do you think people on Hawaii felt like? Okay, we've never experienced an invasion from the outside, have we? You know, and, and you know, in the back of our mind, we hope and think we never will. That's how we live, don't we? We're, we're too big, we're too powerful. The children of Israel said, it'll never happen. You see this in Jeremiah, because he says, we got the city of God and we've got the temple of God, so nothing, nothing bad's going to happen. Well, it didn't work. And what <coughs> excuse me, Ezekiel is trying to communicate to these people is actually the dire strait that's awaiting them in just a few years. Oh, but if would they listen? But they would not listen. Their hearts were hard. They were stiff-necked and rebellious. Now, to the third point, which I'm going to read the rest of the chapter now, beginning in verse 21, is a proverb. In Ezekiel 12, it says this in verse 21, And the word of the Lord came to me, son of man. What is this proverb that you have and that you is referring to the people have about the land of Israel saying, the days grow long and every vision comes to nothing. Tell them therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to this proverb and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say to them, the days are near and the fulfillment of every vision. For there shall be no more any false visions or flattering divinations within the house of Israel. For I am the Lord, I will speak the word that I will speak and it will be performed. It will no longer be delayed, but in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord God. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, behold, they of the house of Israel say the visions that he sees is for many days from now and he prophesies of times far off. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord. Now this proverb in essence carried the idea that they were questioning the... Um, 
the, the, the validity and the, uh, and the veracity of God's word. God said things. He never kept what he said. What's, where's God? You know, they would look at all the promises that God made to Israel and said, well, God's not keeping them. Now, they would not so much come out with a, a, a proverb that would do this directly. But nonetheless, they would say something that would be a subtle attack on God. Later on, we'll see another proverb. The other proverb is the father has eaten soured grapes. And you know what the rest of it is? And set the children's teeth on edge. They said, we're, we're being punished because of our fathers. And you know what that means? That was not verbally directed toward God, but nonetheless, it was not so subtle of a disrespect toward God. Now, here's the thing. It's strange. Here's God. It says, you're a rebellious house. Ezekiel has carried out these two prophetic um, theater events, these you know, uh, street theater performances. He's, he's acted as a sign. It's coming. And you're still using this? You're still disrespecting me? You're still denying my words? You're still repudiating what I have to say? How dumb can you get? But this essentially was the, 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 the inner attitude of these people. The inner attitude of the people was, well, I guess God's not going to keep his words. The other aspect of it was, well, maybe God's going to keep his words. He's going to judge the people, but it's going to be way, 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 way away. They never really heard what God said. They never really saw what God said. And so God, the Lord, responds quite forcefully. He declares, and I read it, he says, you know, verse 25. <laughs> Let me read that again in verse 28. Verse 25 says, For I am the Lord, I will speak the word that I will speak. And it will be performed. It will, it will no longer be delayed. But in your days, O rebellious house, I will speak the word and perform it declares the Lord and in verse 20, 28. Therefore says them, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, none of my words will be delayed any longer, but the word that I speak will be performed, declares the Lord God. And essentially, oh, you don't think I mean what I say, do you? You don't think I mean what I said. Well, I'm saying it again and there will be no delay and you will know. You will experience my word. And that's the same God who sits on the throne today. Remember in Peter? It says there will be so many people. Where's the promise of his coming? Right? Everything. God's not, doesn't do care. He doesn't do anything. He's just, even, you know, that whole thing, right? Now, what God is doing is, is, if you will, giving a time if people would repent. But that is not in any way going to derail God's judgment. It's a frightful thing. And here's the thing. They didn't get it. Now, we look at these people and we want to get a stamp on it. You know, we read the Bible and we want to say stupid, <laughs> dumb, hard-hearted, Stiff neck, right? But the question is this. This was written for you as well, isn't it? All Scripture is given by God. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So how do we come to this text? Two texts, and then I have three closing questions, or three closing considerations. In Psalm 26, 2, this is what the psalmist says. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, for your steadfast love before my, or excuse me, for your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. And then we are very, very familiar with uh, Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
three quick considerations. And these, are, these have to be seriously taken. There is a real prospect of a personal ignorance to God's word on our part. Now, clearly, the lost are ignorant at the core. They don't know, they don't think, they're dead to God and they're really dead to his word. But there are people who I believe are genuine Christians who in a sense have eyes to see and e excuse me, who have eyes and ears but really do not see. And they really do not hear all that God has to say. I could take you right now to scriptures that we have all read that in real terms we jump over. We are indifferent to. Oh, we can read the words in public, but we are really not responding according to the reality. They are God's words. These are not suggestions. These are God's commandments to us. And we have to understand and we have to come to terms with the reality that in some measure, each of us have personal blindness to something the Word of God. The psalmist, David, a man after God's own, he said, search me. That leads to the second point. If we really have a... a, a an understanding of the frailty and the weakness and the, and the potential blindness that we have, then we ought to have a genuine desire for God's careful examination. Those people that Ezekiel ministered to and the people that Jesus ministered to, they, they would probably be able to run rings around us in regard to biblical knowledge. They knew it. I mean, look at the Pharisees, right? Look at, look at Saul of Tarsus. How well educated was he? You know, we look at the, the letters of the Apostle Paul and how often does he reference Scripture? Now, have you ever thought he probably didn't carry around a scroll with him? The only place that you would find a copy of the scriptures were where? In the synagogue? This, we, how, many, how many of us have multiple copies of the Bible? And then when we try to, you know, where's that verse? You know, okay. Here's, the, here's Saul of Tarsus, who was well educated in the scripture, but did he, have, he had eyes and he had ears, but he didn't, he, he didn't see and he didn't hear. Now, if we are honest in our Christian life, and honest before God, then we want a genuine examination by God of our lives as it pertains to seeing and hearing God's Word. Now the proof of whether or not we're serious is that we will have a heartfelt, constant request of God to do that divine scrutiny. Now, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to walk out of this building sometime this afternoon. And, and will we be truly smitten? Will we truly say, God, I never really got that. But I, how much am I like the children of Israel, the rebellious house? I've got eyes. I've got ears. I've heard your word. I've seen your word. But have I known you in your word? Have I heard you in your word? No, you know what honestly was going to happen? I mean, this is just my take on it. We're going to pat ourselves on the back in a sense. Just say, I'm, I'm okay. No, we won't say that. We won't talk that way. But the real question will be, you will have a way to determine whether or not you're, you're, you're really want this. You're going to say today sometime, God, this is, real, this is real important stuff. You've given your word certainly to train me and teach me. But you have given your word to reprove and correct me. And I am clueless. 
I can't see my own blindness where it is. Oh God, please search me. Try me. Prove me. Prod me. Because my heart's desire is not to be blind to your word. How serious do you take God? The children of Israel had all the external trappings. They had all the words. They had the right ritual and they were dead. And many throughout all the history, the professing people of God have been numbered many in that group. But here's David, the psalmist, who heartfelt cry to God for scrutiny because it was a recognition that they themselves realized they were blind to something in their life. Do you want the Scriptures to do their work that God intends? Then with heartfelt seriousness, as the psalmist did, pray that God would do that. And He will. But expect it to be at the least and comfortable. But understand that God does it with His people solely out of care and love. For whom the Lord loves, He corrects. We must take the Word of God with that seriousness. So we work our way through the book of Ezekiel. <coughs> God will always have something to teach us and God will always have something to correct us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the word. I am thankful that you correct us. In Hebrews, it says that if you don't correct, if you don't reprove, if you don't get us back on the the right way, it is indicative that we do not belong. Father in heaven, may our hearts be smitten. May we be serious to ask you to search to put us through through divine scrutiny that we might have our hearts unveiled to us. You see them as they are. And Lord, bring to the surface the Spirit of God may work (coughs) that we would refuse (coughs) and reject our personal blindness and bias to your word. Please help and guide to that end. I do pray it in Christ's name. Amen.